right, welcome back to another episode of The Christian Sages. I decided not to go as dramatic as last time with this Thank introduction. <laughs> Whatever, you love my you love my dramatics. You love them. I'm a very dramatic person. You can't see my Thank jazz you. hands because we're not using video, but if we were, you could see my <laughs> jazz hands. Yeah, you got uh, these at Angus's. <laughs> All right, so we're going to be covering the Book of Micah as we continue with our Minor Prophet series, and we may head as on. As a tribute to my son? Yes, as a tribute to your son you and my nephew. You were going to leave that out, weren't you? I was going to. I'm sorry. I mean, my nephew is also named Micah, but I would not admit. Like, he's not the Micah <laughs> that prophesied because my <laughs> sister is not that old. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, good thing you cleared that up. Yeah, I, I don't want. Yeah, confused. I don't want. Well, I don't want to admit if I say my sister looks like she's a, a thousand years old. I don't think I would be, or two thousand. Actually, it's more like two thousand. I don't think that she would be real happy with me if I'm like, "Hey, little sis." <laughs> good point. Jake. Yeah, I would die. She'd murder <laughs> me in my sleep. She'd come over while I'm sleeping and kill me. Be like, "You think I'm a thousand years old?" Yeah. Sorry, Lex. You wouldn't kill me. I know. Anyway, so we're going to be talking about the book of Micah. Uh, why don't, do you have any thoughts, Doug, uh, yeah, to start um, out with? <laughs> well, we talked about it before, how it's sort of the same sort of thing. And really, Micah is called like all these other prophets. He's called to proclaim God's word, God's will, and he's naturally going to expose sin. Are you still there? Oh, yeah, I'm still here. So all the true prophets of God, they preach God's word. Yeah. which exposes darkness and sin. And so this brings yes. up discomfort. And really, when we look at our culture, whatever is common is considered to be normal. And yes, whatever is normal is assumed to be good. Right. You know, whatever happens a lot is considered acceptable. Right. It's funny, it kind of goes with our other conversation. And whatever goes on in in our culture these days, really it infiltrates into the tr church sure. very quickly. Absolutely. And so I think that's one thing Absolutely. that is important with these uh, minor prophets is really is is they come in and and they basically call out the holiness and righteousness of God, which right. is what we're supposed to desire, what we're supposed to long for, right. which is what su is supposed to separate us that's from right. the world. And really that's... Um, you know, so you take like some of the things that seep in. Well, tolerance, right. for example, absolutely, or or everybody's basically good, right? And so that's why we hear some preachers these days going into well, ninety nine percent of people are good by nature, right? Right. And and you know, well, I'm not right. trying to to say Jesus is the only way, but I'd like to reach everybody of that's all right. faith. Yeah. And what you're doing is you're really inoculating people. From receiving the gospel, because True. they think, oh, I got this little spiritual splinter, right? Right. So instead of thinking, I've got a cataclysmic heart condition, I need Jesus, they're yeah. thinking, I, oh, I'm pretty good, oh boy, I need a, a this splinter removed. Right. Well, they, and, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, so. Absolutely. No, I like what you're saying, because I think you see that in Micah. Because um, what they're talking about, yeah. like he talks, he goes on to talk about how um, the prophets are paying for their divination so because right. they're praying for the divination he's going to cut off the word of the lord so they're going to be dark but they're not going to have any revelation so they're not going to be able and, and you know he talks a lot about darkening them but it's it's very poetic he's not talking about actually turning off the sun but that they're that their inner spiritual eyesight is going to be darkened because right. they're pay, they're charging for for the word of the lord that their priests are charging uh, 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 for giving uh, the sacraments, in essence, you know uh, that they're being that they're charging that they're that they their their leaders are unjust. But it's but you can see how this is kind of a cultural thing that has taken root. Like the sin has become acceptable to these right. people, and they're not seeing it. They're they're not seeing how this this way of doing things. It's like well, so and so is doing it, so I guess I'll do it. You know what well, I'm saying? Like, like well, the, the other prophets are doing it, so I'm, I guess I'll do it. And and you see this slow progression where where you become desensitized to, to right, right exactly. and wrong. Because really, consistent truth, and that's what we really need these days, is you see Christians backing off of our foundation, which is the right. Word of God, and saying, well, I'll, I'll reason with these people based on, on rationality and right. 
come up with smart, creative arguments yeah. to win them to the conservative side, and then maybe right. they'll become Christians. That's or, right. And so, or maybe if I just love them enough, and I and I don't talk about sin enough, and I don't, right. And I'm not in the, you know, I'm not saying I'm like I do think there needs to be a balance, but but right, right. never addressing any issues because you're afraid people are going to leave your church doesn't work either. That's right. Not, you, it will. You know. Yeah, it will be uncomfortable. You know, so, but, um, but that, that's, that's the whole thing. Did, did it stop Jesus? Did it stop no. the prophets? Did it stop the apostle no. Paul? Did he, he, he go in and say, you know what? I'm going to hold back a little bit because I'm going to kind of right. get to know them for a few months and, and really just see, let them see how kind I am. And, you know, because really, right. if you think about it, Mormons are some of the nicest people in the world. Yeah, they are. They really are. They're, Absolutely. They're some of the nicest people in the world. They have some great fruits, and we can look at them and say, oh, they're not that bad, really. But when Jesus says you'll know them by their fruits, what's he's, right. what he's talking about That's is right. words. He's really talking about primarily words because he says yes. by your yes. words you will be justified, by your words by your you will words. be Absolutely. condemned, by their fruits you will know them. Yep. And so, Absolutely. Um, you know, and but we can't back away from standing on a consistent Christian belief system. Right. You know, because the world doesn't accept it. Well, so that's, what you know, saying, absolutely. That's what the Bible, what he's talking about in, in a lot of when he's talking to, to the Israelites, he's like, you're not exempt because you're Israel. Right. You're not exempt from doing the right thing. You're not exempt just because you're, you have a covenant with me does not make you exempt from the law. That does not make you, it's not all of a sudden that there's just a justification for you to, to continue to live a lifestyle of sin. Eventually, there are consequences that are going to come from that lifestyle of sin. Because we talk a lot about the, we've talked about this in, uh, in past Minor Prophets, uh, how it's not, I don't view it as the wrath of God. I view it as consequences for sin. And, if, and God can only t remove those consequences for so long before they will come. And just because you're the children of God does not mean that you're exempt from that. Just because you're the Israelites does not mean they were exempt. Just because you're a Christian does not mean that you're exempt from consequences of sin, which is death. If, if you're going to continue to live a lifestyle of sin, there will be consequences. You know, And, yeah. and God does not always remove those consequences because you, you reap what you sow. And if you're going to live a lifestyle, it's going to produce. We've talked about this in the past. I mean, if you cheat on your wife, you could be forgiven, and God loves you, and He wants to restore you. But your marriage might not be restored. You know, right. there there may be a consequence for your philandering. You know, or yeah. you may get sick. Uh, 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 let's say you, you know, you might get AIDS and die. You know, uh, or whatever. You might get really sick or get a sexually transmitted disease because you committed a sin, a lifestyle of sin. It wasn't like, oh, I fell once and. What, you know, but what I'm saying is, even if you fall as a as a philanderer, like you cheat on your wife, she may not want to take you back, and she doesn't have to. Right. You know what I'm saying? God, God may not be able to fix that because there's another person involved, and there will be a consequence for that. And you're not exempt from it because you're a Christian. And the Israelites right. were not exempt from it. Neither the prophets, right. neither the priests. If you're not going to live right, you're not exempt from the consequences. I mean, you look at all men of faith. Uh, Abraham suffered consequences for certain things. Jacob especially sir, uh, suffered, and Isaac, all of them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, David really is the prime example because we have so much scripture written about him. We know a lot about his life and how his last 20 years were sort of a spiral downward. But, right. yeah, you're right. You're, you know. Um, well, I want to show you in, in, in uh, <laughs> chapter 1, verse 8. Now, obviously, I had to find something like this. It isn't funny, even though it's kind of funny. But it shows you just <laughs> shows you just how important it is to God. He says, "Therefore, I will wail and howl. I will go stripped and naked. I will make a wailing like the jackals and a mourning like the ostriches. For her wounds are incurable. For it has come to Judah. It has come to the g gate of my people, to Jerusalem. And that's how it, how it was tore him up so much that he's like, I'm stripping myself naked and running around screaming like an ostrich." And wailing like a jackal because the wound that you have received is incurable. And he's talking about yeah. Judah. He says, it's finally come to you, Judah, yeah. to my people. It has come to your gates, and it's incurable. And and that to and me is very what, sad. Like that's, God yeah. is saying, listen, it's got to the point where I can't do anything anymore. Like you're, it's coming. The wrath is coming. Yeah, and um, 
you know, that's what sin does. It's it it starts out. It might be a small cut, and then it moves deeper and deeper, and eventually you you get to the point where you're just bleeding out, you know, and it's only a matter of time. And in this case, it's uh, it's it's prophesied in chapter four where right. Babylon, the Babylonian captivity, and yep. the Syrian uh, captivity. But um, we well, says so at the end of this too. That you, I will, I will yet bring an heir to you, O inhabitant of Marishai. Now he's talking about, I think, the Messiah there. But he says yes. the glory of Israel shall come to Adullam. But he also says, make yourself bald and cut off your hair because of your precious children. Enlarge your baldness like an eagle, for they shall go from you into captivity. So he's talking about the captivity is going to come, but yeah. I will bring restoration. You and, know, it, and so he's prophesying captivity there as well. Uh, one thing. Uh, I kind of thought was neat was you look at um, going back to um, what we were talking about preaching the word, whether it's convenient or not living for right. God, whether it's convenient or not. Right. Um, you know, cause if you tell people, if you don't tell people what it will cost them, if they reject Christ, you'll, you'll be labeled something bad. Right. You know? Um, so, it, but as long as you do not tell the whole story, um, they will tolerate you. If right. you give them a soft gospel. Sure. If you know, if you give them a soft, like comfortable gospel, you know right. they'll they'll tolerate you. But it, it, but here's the thing, you know, because here's the thing. Here's how a lot of us, you know, even I, a lot of times when you when you uh, present the gospel to somebody or share the gospel, you start out and you don't talk about too much of, you, you know, um, what will happen if they reject Christ. But right. you start out like, I want you to accept. I want you to accept. I want Christ right. loves you. He died right. for you. And they really don't have a conviction of their sin. I think Ray Comfort talked about this, where he was witnessing to all these people, and then within three months, they weren't even coming to church anymore. And um, he said, and then really he saw much more sorrow over sin when he just brought the law up. And he sure. said, this is the law of God. And you are, you know, and he brought that up right off the bat and just said, I'm just going to be blunt with you. And then here's what Jesus Christ did for you. And so you can accept it and or you can reject it. But um, also Micah means who is like the Lord. Right. That's what we have to face, you know, talking about how committed we are to right. Christ. Are we right. going to bow to who is like the beast and say, yes, who is like the beast? Or right. who is like the Lord? No one's like the Lord, and so that's what really what uh, Micah brings up here. And, and throughout history, tyrants know that Christians are the most loyal subjects. Right, right. But they are also the more most fearless in rebellion, precisely yes. because Christians know that there is one who is greater than the beast. That's right. That's right. And so that's one thing that really motivates me about Mike and, and yeah, I named yeah. my son Mike because I love that question. Who is like the Lord? There's no one. Right. No one like right. the Lord. And, and sort of the end of the book. Um, That's right. Yeah. Verse, you know, verse 18, 19 in chapter seven are some great verses. To get back to a different point, because I was kind of going through Micah six and one of my friends had brought up the scripture, and I really like this because to get back to the idea that they kind of thought they were exempt, um, yeah. it says, uh, Micah 6, 6, he says, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? With the Lord, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before your God. And I, I love that because he's saying, listen, you're, you're, what do we do? Let's, let's give all of these sacrifices. And God's yeah. like, well, I've already told you what to do. I've told you to live this lifestyle. And the lifestyle is to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And you're failing at all of this. And you think that just by bringing me all of these sacrifices, but by not changing the heart problem, that that's going to be okay. You need to change the heart problem, and you won't. You just want to keep bringing these sacrifices. But I've already told you what you need to do, and that's to change your heart attitude and to, and to start doing what I've told you to do. You want to bring sacrifices because you're not just in your dealings. You don't have mercy. And right. you don't, you're not walking humbly before me anymore. 
And that's all I've required okay. you to do. It's not that hard. And I've, you know this. I've already told you this, but you're not listening. And because you won't change your heart, your sacrifices don't matter at this point. But right. your heart needs to change. Now, that being said, let's switch this back to – let's switch this to what the minor prophets and most of the prophets you see, because we had talked about this before, how um, – Micah is very similar to all the other prophets. Mercy and then restoration. I mean, wrath and yeah. restoration. Um, okay, you're terrible and you're, and you're sinning and your heart is bad. Because it always goes back to the heart. They're just their heart strays. And that when your heart strays, your actions begin to change. And the heart issue is the problem. It's not the actions because the actions just show where your heart is. So your heart right. attitude has changed here. And so then there's restoration. And the restoration is always, like in particular, you really see it in Micah, is, is it's all about the Messiah and the fact that there's a remnant, that there's this right. remnant that's coming, okay? That, that, that yes, I, Israel, there, there's, I cannot dissuade this wrath that's coming, the consequences for your sin, as we had said before. I, can't, it's, I can no longer pass over that. It's going to come. But I love you, and I will restore you. And I will bring a remnant who is going to be ruled by the Messiah. And you see that throughout this whole book. He's talking about the Messiah. And, and, and the Israelites knew this. They did this right up to the time of Jesus. They were expecting this Messiah. Um, so the remnant, we, you know, what is the remnant? So, we, so some people believe that the remnant is the people that are the Jewish people that are returning to Israel. So let's say the remnant would be uh, once they renewed Israel. Was it, what year was it? I think you know what year Israel was made a co country again. Nineteen forty-eight. Uh, Nineteen forty-eight. So in nineteen forty-eight, when all of the when all of the Jews returned to Israel, that's the remnant, and then the Messiah would come. Now we we believe as Christians that the remnant is the body of Christ. That we represent the, that remnant because the Messiah was Jesus. And that was the Messiah right. that was preached. And um, so, but there's a lot of people that would say that, you know, we're wrong in thinking that way, that this really, God can't come back and the fulfillment of what God wants to do can't happen until Israel, be, uh, or the, is the remnant, which is Israel, is saved, or I'm not sure what exactly they're looking for out of this. But, but like, there's yeah. a lot of people that say Israel holds, like, a special place for God, and that remnant is actually Israel, and not the body of Christ. Yeah. I think in certain places where you see people point to, um, like I said, dispensationalists, right. who basically have separated uh, the Israelites and parenthesized the church as the spiritual aspect right. of God's people, and the Jews as being the um, those who are still going to have promises fulfilled. Now, there might be some promises, but I don't think they're the ones they're talking about. Right. They'll right. point to scriptures where about a remnant returning from the sure. four corners of the earth. Right. But when when a, a lot of these prophecies have are actually already been fulfilled, because when the, even in Micah um, and some of the other yes. prophets, yeah. a lot of them are talking about God bringing them back right from, from out captivity, of captivity out of captivity. But, Absolutely. But yeah, but what you were saying about the one people of God, what I would say is the body of Christ is the present day expression of the one people of God, whose roots go all the way back to Abraham. And what we see is that um, in Galatians chapter 3, and in many other places, but Paul, he basically says that you are, you are children of Abraham by faith right. in Christ. Right. And so... Right. Becoming God's people and heirs of his promises right. does not come by observing sure. Jewish law, but by placing one's faith in Christ. Right, and then we understand so, that. We understand that. Yeah. And, and I think that, like, uh, you know, we—I think the Israelites— was one of the reasons why they couldn't—the the Jewish leaders could not see Jesus as the Messiah was because they were expecting a physical kingdom restoration. They were looking for a, the Messiah to come and physically— make Israel the power, the greatest power in the world. That was what they were expecting. Uh, it's one of right. the reasons a lot of people, and I believe this too, one of the reasons why um, uh, uh, Judas betrayed Jesus was he eventually realized that Jesus is saying he's going to go die, but he's supposed to be this conquering king. And Judas was waiting for him to take this political stance 
that that would make him this political king, and he never, and then he realized he's not going to do that. So he felt this. He felt like that that gave away for the enemy to come in because he was like, well, then this can't be the Messiah because I he was looking only from a physical standpoint. That this and, and right. a lot of the a lot of the Israel that's why Jesus was so angry with the the religious leaders at the time was they couldn't they, they should have known that we're talking about a spiritual kingdom here, but they were expecting right. a physical kingdom, and that that was right. you know they should have understood that this was all in a spiritual standpoint, but they could only see through the eyes of the physical. Right. When you think about it, if, if like dispensationalism really became popular in like 1900 and with the Schofield study Bible, it became a lot bigger. Right. And so for pretty much for almost 2000 years, the church has believed that there's one people of God that we have been engrafted in that we're not talking about replacement right. theology. Yeah. We're talking about being engrafted into the body of Christ through, uh, through faith. Right. And so in Hebrews 11, though, just what you said, I would ask this of dispensationalists what Abraham believed. And it says right. that he did not hope for an earthly city. That's right. He but did a heavenly a one. Heavenly one. Exactly. Whose builder and maker was God, and the patriarchs desired a better country, a right. heavenly one. That's what Hebrews 11, 10, absolutely. And verse absolutely. 16 say. Well, absolutely. So, absolutely. Yeah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they all understood. They had faith in that their citizenship was not on this earth. And Paul tells us the same thing. In Philippians 3.20, he tells us we are citizens of heaven. Now, to be a little bit of a devil's advocate, if you were, let's say, uh, uh, a Hebrew, you could say, well, that's being written by a Christian. Even though though he was a Hebrew, he's a Christian. So he could say, well, that's his interpretation of what Moses thought. (laughs) <laughs> because he's a Christian, well, so he's going back and interpreting what Moses said and thought through his own understanding of who the Messiah was. I, I'm just being a devil's out. advocate because you know where I believe. Yeah, I, so. I know you are. Check this out. <laughs> I'd say, well, a Jew named Jesus in Matthew eight eleven said, I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at the table of yeah. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the yep. kingdom of heaven. So the whole body of Christ is the true Israel of God, the seed of Abraham, and we are heirs of Israel's covenant promise. So right. every time someone is born again today, whether Jew or Gentile, God is being faithful to his right. promise to right. Abraham, which which in Galatians 3, 8, and 9, Paul says that the Abrahamic promise was the gospel. Oh, absolutely. Being preached to absolutely. Abraham in Genesis 12. So I think it's it's amazing because it it's, it's something where if you don't see that, you really right. see— if you're a Gentile, you see yourself almost as sure, like a sure. second class. Like, do I get to sit at the kids' table? Well, that's in yeah. I mean, w- w- that's kind of the view that I heard it at to some degree. Like, we were we were kind of second class to the to Messianic Jews. People, Jews who got saved, were somehow more important than Gentiles. Okay, I'll sit at saved. the kids' table. I'm yeah. sure still, but I mean, <laughs> well, it's like that whole scripture where he says, you know, oh, I've come to the woman said came to him and said, you know, I need, can you heal my daughter. And she's, I think she's possessed by a devil. And he said, I, you know, I came to the children of Israel and why would I give the, why would I give the bread that was meant for Israel to, to the dogs? And she said, well, even the dogs eat the scraps at your table. And so a lot of people kind of use that scripture to say, well, Gentiles are dogs and we're eating the scraps from what was left over from the Jews. And I disagree with that. Why do I disagree with that? One scripture for one. Um, is Romans 2, 25, where he's talking about circumcision, which is the representation of the covenant that they claim. That 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 is what says, like, I'm different, is that covenant I have, and circumcision is a representation of that covenant. And he says, for circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker right. of the law, your circumcision has been uncircumcised. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you who even with your written code and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one inwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart." In the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. So he's saying right there that it's not about the physical being born or even the physical representation of that covenant. That doesn't matter. What matters is your heart. 
The circum- right. Your heart is what determines whether or not you are a Jew because, or, or a child of God because your heart is the issue. If by your right. heart you're, able, you're fulfilling the law because your heart is changed, then you're circumcised. That, that, the, the, you represent that covenant. But if you're circumcised and you have the physical manifestations, you're born a Jew, you have, you, you know, you've had, you're uh, circumcised, but your heart is not right, well, it doesn't matter. Because the right. physical doesn't matter. This is a spiritual thing. The spirit is what matters. Check this out. So that's absolutely right. Check this out. So Hophni and Phineas were circumcised Jews, but they were not true Israel. Right. Caiaphas was a religious high priest. He was not true Israel. Rahab, though, became a part of true Israel by faith, right. as well as others who came to Christ who were Gentiles. So throughout redemptive history, circumcision right. of the heart has always been the mark. In Deuteronomy 10, it says circumcise your heart. Jeremiah 4, 1 through 4, it says circumcise your heart. So the physical sign of circumcision was a sign and seal of the covenant God right. established with Abraham right. and pointed to um, what was going on in the heart at the heart level. Yes. But here's the thing. When you said about the woman, uh, the Messiah, the sign of circumcision pointed to a couple things, but right. it also pointed to the fact that the Messiah would be cut off from his people. That's right. And that yeah, he would yeah. be cut. And, and at the time when he said that to the woman, he had not yet been cut off. He was right. there absolutely. to speak first to the Jews. That's right. Absolutely. Um, I agree. Through who the seed, you know, the seed of the Messiah came. And so his work was not yet done to open the door That's right. for the for the Gentiles, but he didn't shut. You know, if you look at it, God never shuts the door on those who come and have faith. And no, absolutely. Well, I mean, even like, when he like was in have... Samaria, he went to the, he went all the way to Samaria for one woman, a Samaritan woman. She wasn't a Jew, right? And met her at a well, just because she and because she was looking, she was searching for him. That was why right. the first thing out of her mouth when he talked to her, she said, I perceive that you're a prophet. Are you the Messiah? She was waiting for it. They were looking for it, but she was not a Jew. She was a Samaritan. And yet he went out of his way to talk to her. Another scripture I like, which goes back to the idea that, that it's all about the spirit, not about a physical covenant anymore. It's about a spiritual covenant. In uh, Romans 8, 12, where he says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we we may also be glorified together. So he's talking again about a spiritual covenant. It is the right. spiritual that makes the difference. It is the spirit that determines being a son or not, not where you're physically born or what you physically do to your body. It is the spirit right. that determines that. And another thing, you know, if you're just going out by a historical standpoint too, well, we're all, we all came from Adam and Eve. So yes, he made a covenant with Israel, but we're all children of God. The covenant was made with Israel to bring the Messiah about so that we could all be restored. Plus, who told Abraham about God in essence? Melchizedek. So when Melchizedek came, he was a high priest of the most holy of, of the high God, and he gave tithes to Melchizedek. Was Melchizedek a right. Jew? He couldn't have been a Jew because he wasn't a no. son of Abraham. So therefore, he was not a Jew. He was from a completely right. different whatever. We don't even know who Melchizedek was or where he, where he came from. I mean, there are a lot of people who say, well, he was Jesus, he was an angel, he was, you know. But I believe he was just a man who loved God, who knew God, yeah. because these we were all descendants from Adam and Eve, and he he followed God and had, a, and had in his understanding, a relationship with God. I mean, he calls him a high priest. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It wasn't like he was just some guy. He was called a high priest, so much so that Abraham paid his tithe to him. So if if it's if the covenant was only Jew for for the Hebrews, then who's Melchizedek? Yeah, yeah, and and the thing is, I think people often think that in the Old Testament there was the ceremonial aspect of the Mosaic covenant. Yes. You, so you look at the Abrahamic Absolutely. covenant. Uh, all right, let me back up. So in Hebrews, it's clearly talking about the ceremonial aspect of the, of the covenant where you, you needed a priest. Well, Jesus is a better priest. 
You needed sacrifices. Well, Jesus is the once and for all greatest sacrifice. You needed, you know, he's greater than Moses. He's greater than Aaron. So there was obviously, when it says that the covenant would, the old covenant would go away and the new one would be established, right. it wasn't saying that Abraham doesn't matter anymore, David, right, because exactly. God says to both Abraham and David, your covenant is everlasting. It's fulfilling Absolutely. Christ, Absolutely. and it continues. Absolutely. And so, and, and that's also why Paul calls us children of Abraham. You know, and he's not he's not talking about Jews. He's talking about those who are in Christ. Right. We're called but, children of Abraham because the covenant he made with Abraham was a spiritual one. And when right, he says exactly, that I'm going to make exactly. your people, you know, you're going to look up and your children are going to be as the stars of the sea. He was talking in a spiritual sense, not just in a national sense, but like right. in a physical national sense. But in a spiritual sense, you are going to birth children that are far, that are that are that are that are more than the stars that you're looking at, because spiritually you're going to have children, not just a physical sense that you're going to have children, but spiritually you're going to have children that are going to come from you, from you. Right. Because without Abraham, we wouldn't have. We wouldn't have this, the Messiah. We wouldn't have any of this without well, Abraham having a covenant with God. If you think about it, I, I, this is why I cringe, or I don't just cringe, I, I can't stand it. When I hear a lot of pastors these days talking about the Old Testament saying we just, just cut it out, throw it out, because it's not going to bring anybody into the body of Christ, or, or, or people outside of church don't understand it and, and reject it, so we should not, you know, because we're New Testament Christians. No, nonsense. The whole you're you're throwing out God's revelation. Okay? Right. That's God's word. Right. And and what did the disciples use? What did Jesus use? But I wanted to point out that Paul emphasizes that there's the continuity between the old and new testaments by calling it the Abrahamic promise, the gospel. Yeah. And so the Old Testament is a Christian testament because the storyline of of redemption flows throughout all of scripture. As Old Testament put Absolutely. Old Testament saints Absolutely. put their faith in Christ, looking forward to the promise of His coming and That's accomplishing right. That's their right. salvation. Well, that so right. We look, right. yeah. So they looked and they saw Christ through types and shadows, right? And so these all things pointed. Now we see much more clearly, um, which right. is I we forgot do. where it is where he says um, some. I think Jesus says uh, the. There were men who would have loved to see my day or something like that. But, um, I mean, it's, but back to cutting out the Old Testament. The, you all right there? Oh, oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I wouldn't have stopped other way. But I'm anyway, fine. so you, you cut out the Old Testament. It's ridiculous because it's clearly saying that the moral, that ceremonial law, like God's moral law, what does Paul, what does Paul and Peter, what are they referring to when they say, for example, uh, children honor your mother and father, for this is the com- this is the only commandment where there is a promise that it will go well with you. Right. What, what are they referring to? I mean, it's the Old Testament. It's well, the, you don't it, throw out. I mean, Paul even said that you don't throw it out. You don't throw the the New Testament is a fulfillment of the law, but the law still stands. Right. All Scripture you know, is God breathed. In absolutely. Other words. Well, um, we learn it gives validity to the fact that we believe Jesus is the Messiah. The Old Testament. Right. Exactly. It shows us the the nature of God and the covenant that He made with Israel. It does apply to us. Yes, we're under the new covenant, but the the character of God in that covenant applies to the right. to our covenant with Him as well. And and you know, well, and even, even in Micah, over. right? Even in Micah seven, he's talking about who is God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of His heritage. He does not retain His anger forever. He be, because He delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will you will cast out our sins. Into the depths of the sea, you will give truth to Jacob and mercy to Abraham, which he has sworn to our fathers from days of old. That's how it ends, but that shows us the character and nature of God and how that applies to us, because He's talking about us, not just right. Israel and not just the Israeli people, but He's talking about the children of God. He's talking right. about us. That that is for us. Well, we wouldn't have that if we throw out the Old Testament. We wouldn't. You know what I'm saying? It would be like, exactly. how do we understand? That shows us the nature of God. That we understand well, God's nature right there well, it tells would be, us that. It would be crazy because, um, you know, it's funny because even proven Jesus is the Messiah, for example, I was just um, listening to this guy, he was, but he was talking about how 
before um, the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Right. Before they were found, everybody was saying, well, Isaiah just waited till um, Isaiah couldn't have been written 700 years before Christ. It's impossible. It had to be written after because it's too specific. It's too specific, right, yeah. Too, Isaiah 53 is too specific about him. And then they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were, like, the texts were, like, 99% the exact same that we have today. Oh, absolutely. And, absolutely. and you know, the only difference is, is like, little letters or Little, things very throughout. small things that are very definitely— Very small variations. Like when you're transferring, like when you're— uh, tra- uh, Rewriting it, that things, yeah, exactly. You know, you little things that you might put in, that your way which of is, writing would add to which it. Which right. for ancient text, for transliterating ancient text, that's that's phenomenal. And um, oh, there's no but, way that Jesus could be the Messiah. I mean, the reality of it is he fulfilled too much of the prophecies. Yeah, there's no way he's either the he was either the Messiah or he never really existed because the prophecies are too specific and he fulfilled them in such a specific way. As a matter of fact, there was one. I was reading one where they said that a lot of the they refused to accept him as a Messiah because he came from Nazareth instead of Bethlehem, not realizing that he was actually born in Bethlehem. And yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> because if they had not, because accepting him as being born in Bethlehem would oh my well he could be the Messiah oh well he's not because he's a Nazarene. Well, he wasn't born in Nazareth. Exactly. Yeah. Um. And I think a lot of Jews, they look at it like um, they say, well, our Messiah has a political aspect to him. Yeah. And I think that's where, when you get into eschatology, I think that's where it matters. Now, not everybody, not anybody has anything figured out. Right. You know, like men who have been studying this for their whole lives still disagree with other guys. And, you know, so we're not going to have it all figured out. But I think, to me, this is how I see it. He reigns now, you know, he reigns right now. His king, you know, it, it's, there's an already not yet aspect or tension that we have to understand that yeah. when he died and, w- and was resurrected, ascended, you know, into heaven, the right hand of the father, that he is reigning right now. And we are part of that. Like we are part of the new creation. The new created order is already coming in. And so that's why it's important for, yeah. um, that's why it's important for us to understand that, not just yeah, say, yeah, "Oh, let's hold on till this evil age is over with." Right? Absolutely. No, you know, we're yeah. supposed to act now, and that's part of what Paul, in proclaiming the gospel, one of the major things he was proclaiming is not, "Hey, this is how you get saved. You just say this little prayer, and then you do this, and yeah, and you yeah. get you get all the benefits of the kingdom." No, he he was saying, "Jesus Christ is Lord." Yep. And here he's the Messiah. That's right. And here's here's why. Yep. And he was using Old Testament scriptures, by the way, to prove to uh, like the Bereans. Yes. You know, he was going back and showing how Jesus was the Christ. Right. Absolutely. So no, I agree. Kind of I agree. Well, anyway, we'll, we're going to wrap it up there. Um, hopefully uh, you guys liked this episode where we discussed Micah and the Minor Prophets and the remnant. Uh, I, I really feel like you can see this transition really in the Minor Prophets a lot. Um, the, the falling away of Israel, but the restoration, because God is all about restoration. And, and that we as the body of Christ represent the remnant. Uh, of, of that God is talking about there, that we are what God is talking about. I'm going to bring back that remnant that serves me. And, you know, obviously we want to see Israel and also be a part of that, and we believe that that's also a part of what God does. God wants to restore Israel. God wants Israel to come to know him and, want, and be restored through Jesus. So yeah. well, hopefully you like that episode. Um, you can contact us at the uh, ChristianSages.com um, or just the ChristianSage.com. You can do either or. Um, to, to, to reach us if you'd like. We're going to have a Facebook page up. We're also going to have a Twitter and probably an Instagram. My daughter actually put on the, if you if you uh, put it up on our little YouTube page, she, she made a banner for us and a and a um, awesome little uh, logo she for us. She did a really good job. Uh, she's also responsible for having done our website. Um, so we should have all of these up so that you can just link to our uh, Facebook page and link to our Twitter page. And obviously we'll be putting things up on Twitter and Facebook uh, and Instagram that you guys can check out. But um, that's something that will be up 
by the end of this week. Uh, I just moved back to New York, so getting some things going. We really got the YouTube channel up and running, and uh, we want to get that looking really nice. We're going to be back on Podbean probably too here pretty soon, and uh, so you'll be able to access the Podbean stuff. Um, but you can access most of our stuff from the website. You can go to Podbean and check out the Christian Sages, and uh, there's some episodes there that are not on YouTube, but most of the newer stuff's up on YouTube. So check us out there. Give us a call if you need prayer requests or anything else. But hopefully you enjoyed this episode. You have a wonderful night, and we'll see you next time. Good night. Good night. I've been running and trying to chase down who I want to be and I want to write.